Good morning, everyone. It's a pretty strong good morning for uh, Friday morning. I want to welcome all of you, our uh, alumni, faculty, staff, students, and friends, uh, to my annual State of the College address and the final one that I'll deliver uh, to you as your dean here at Syracuse University College of Law. Together with our outstanding faculty and staff and with your steadfast support as alumni, we've reached new heights over the past seven years, realized extraordinary achievements, and impacted the landscape of legal education nationally. And as we gather this morning, I'm filled with a deep sense of pride in the progress that we made. And as I've done in the past, I'll walk you through some of the key transformations and initiatives that have brought us to where we are today. And I'll also share some thoughts about the future of this wonderful institution. So much has changed since July of 2016 when I became the 12th Dean of the College of Law. I had hair um, and it was not as gray. Uh, national and global events over the intervening time have been uplifting at times and dismal at others. Uh, but the one constant and always a constant is change, political, technological, physical, educational, and adapting to that change is not merely a choice, it is a sometimes painful necessity. In the context of legal education, this means that our students must master foundational principles of, principles of law, develop the ability to think critically to solve rapidly emerging legal problems, and adapt to the growing role of technology in the practice of law. To be effective advocates, our graduates must be well prepared to meet and tackle new challenges head on. But we can't expect more of our students than of ourselves. As faculty and staff, as legal educators, we must be prepared for and be willing to adapt to change like our students. And we've demonstrated that we can do that as we built the revolutionary JD Interactive program. And in the process of making that sometimes difficult change, We've led the way among law schools nationally. And in short, we have a responsibility to be at the forefront of legal education. See, when we are, we not only better prepare our students for the future, but we also help to shape that future. As I began my work as Dean of the College of Law, our faculty recognized an opportunity to provide an accessible legal education to students from across the country and around the world who couldn't otherwise obtain one, meeting them where they are. After a great deal of planning and a tremendous amount of groundwork almost five years ago, we launched the first online JD program in the nation to utilize virtual classrooms, JD Interactive. JDI, for those of you who are not familiar with it, combines virtual class sessions with self-paced online instruction, short courses, and on-campus residencies, and a required legal externship. With this unique combination of modalities and a laser focus on creating an outstanding student experience, we not only broke new ground, but law schools around the country are trying to furiously to catch up with us. But we didn't stop there. The success of JDI led us to establish the only online joint JD MBA program in the country, again, breaking new ground two years ago in accessible and forward-leaning legal education. As I contemplate stepping away from the deanship at the end of this academic year, let me just say a word about the future of the JDI program. Right now, JDI is the 800 pound gorilla in the online JD space. And I think it's absolutely critical that we maintain that status. JDI has without question been essential to the law school's fiscal turnaround. This academic year, 45% of the incoming class is made up of JDI students. Looking ahead, the JDI program will also help us to weather the birth rate driven demographic cliff that is going to reduce applications to law school by as much as 15% in a few years. Ensuring the stability and quality of JDI should be job one so that our law school can continue to benefit from the balance of online and residential modes of learning, and importantly, continue to draw nearly half of our students from a pool of applicants that only the small handful of schools with online programs will be able, from which they'll be able to recruit. We also know that that pool of JDI applicants has raised our overall entering credentials to boot. I'm grateful for the leadership of professors Nina Cohn, Casey O'Connor, and now Shannon Gardner, all of whom have led the JDI program. And I'm thankful for those of you who perhaps despite early misgivings, have supported JDI by teaching online and making this 
the absolute best online JD program in the country. And if you don't believe that, just ask our students and graduates who did their due diligence before choosing Syracuse. We've done an amazing thing here together. Let's keep it thriving. In yet another national first, the College of Law partnered a couple of years ago with Access Lex to provide the state-of-the-art adaptive bar prep course, Helix Bar Review, to our students free of charge. I'm someone who took three bar exams with Barbary and was on Barbary's National Advisory Board, but I'm telling you that Helix is not only the best bar course available, it's allowing us to assist our students earlier in a more focused way on their bar preparation. We had a rough bar passage year in 2022, but the good news is that for nearly five years, our students have maintained an ultimate bar passage rate between 90 and 95%. You'll recall that we also set a first time New York bar pass record of nearly 92% just a few years ago. Under the leadership of, of Associate Dean of Academic and Bar Success, Professor Kelly Curtis, we continue to invest resources in support of our students' academic and bar success. Everything we do here at the College of Law is for our students. And over the last seven years, their entering credentials have become more and more impressive. Just take a look at the trajectory of our median LSAT and median GPA numbers. I'm proud to report that this year, our median GPA for the incoming JD class is the highest it's ever been at 3.58. Our 25th percentile LSAT score is now higher than our median or our 50th percentile LSAT score was in 2016 when I arrived. First generation law students now represent 20% of the incoming class, a five percentage point increase over 2018 when we first started measuring the statistic. And we have so many first generation students that they decided to create their own organization, the First Generation Law Students Association. We've also been a key focus of SU's uh, emphasis on veterans and military connected students. 10% of this year's incoming class are veterans compared to 6% in 2016. And in the last few years, the co five College of Law students have been awarded the prestigious Tillman Scholarship for remarkable military service members, veterans, and spouses. Last year, the university had a record four Tillman Scholars, and all three, uh, three of those four were from the College of Law, all three of them in the JDI program. In fact, the College of Law has accounted for 50% of the Tillman Scholars at Syracuse University. U.S. Marine Corps veteran Natasha DeLeon, Navy veterans Robin Evans and Amanda Higginson, and Army veterans Bill Riley and Lou Weyerbach, thank you for your service. To serve our spectacular students, we've recently restructured the previous Office of Student Affairs into a more purposeful Office of Career Services and Student Experience. Widening our students' horizons beyond the walls of Deneen Hall and, get, and providing access to health, well-being, and other resources that are available to the broader SU campus. The collective passion of our career services and student experience team led by Assistant Dean Lily Hughes is enhancing law students' school experience and guiding them toward meaningful legal careers following their time at the College of Law. Assistant Dean Hughes and her team in the Office of Career Services have diligently worked on innovative programming, career coaching, and expanding internship, externship, and post-graduation options for our students. This year, they were able to confirm the employment status of 100% of our 2022 graduates. That's the highest number that we've ever achieved. And it's not easy tracking students once they've left the building, but knowing our graduate employment status enables us to assist them in finding jobs and has led to a nearly 14.5% increase in the employment number that we report to the ABA. And for those who care about the US News ranking, even that weighted metric is up by over 12 and a half percent. A key part of the career and student experience transition is expansion of student externships. I'm happy to report that we've increased overall student externship placements by 55% over the last four years. Externships, of course, are also a key component of Orange Flex, formerly known as the Third Year Away Program which allows JD residential students to spend their entire third year away from Syracuse and, and satisfy their graduation requirements with a combination of a supervised externship and online courses courtesy of JDI. 
Last year, with the help of our alumni, the Office of Career Services placed 195 students in externships in 29 states, many of them made power possible by our powerful Orange Alumni Network. To all of you who host our students as externs, a heartfelt thank you. We are deep, deeply grateful. Now, switching gears a bit, I want to point out that one of my highest priorities during my time as dean has been to foster a learning community that celebrates the diversity of its members because understanding and respecting multiple points of view is an essential element of effective legal practice. Reflecting on the past few years, I believe we've succeeded. On average, students of color have comprised 30% of our entering classes over the last seven years with a record 37% for the entering class of 2022. Last year was also remarkable for the fact that the Advocacy Honor Society president, Student Bar Association president, and Law Review editor-in-chief were all Black women, Olivia Stevens, Mazi Kayla, and Hilda Frimprong, respectively. We created the first Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion role at the college. We established a new Inclusion Council, and thanks to a grant from Access Lex, we launched the Orange Advanced Pipeline Program, a partnership with Spelman <laughs> College Morehouse College and Clark Atlanta Uni University. Through this program, we've now welcomed two cohorts of prospective law students to our Syracuse Summer Academy, where they've met faculty members, students and alumni. They've learned about the legal profession and how to prepare for law school and network with lawyers at a slate of cultural and social events here in Syracuse. And finally, we dedicated the Honorable Sandra Towns Class of 76 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Student Resource Center in the Law Library. Named for the pioneering jurist and educator who was the first Black woman appointed as a federal judge in the Eastern District of New York. Despite the Supreme Court's decision this summer prescribing the use of race in admissions, our new enrollment team, under the leadership of Assistant Dean of Enrollment Management, Kathy Fox, will continue to build classes that reflect a broad diversity of experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives, and ensure that the College of Law remains a place welcoming to all. In the spirit of increasing cultural diversity and exposing our students to global perspectives, we established the Office of International Programs in January of 2017. Under the leadership of Assistant Dean Andrew Horsfall, we've since launched three short-term study abroad pro courses in Switzerland, France, and England. We've also formed two dozen new institutional partnerships with foreign law schools and government agencies that have in turn sent LLM students and visiting scholars to Syracuse. These include the University of Bialystok and Adam Mikhailowicz University in Poland, the Georgian Bar Association in the Republic of Georgia, and thanks to the efforts and connections of Professor Antonio Gidi, several important associations of judges and state and federal government lawyers in Brazil. Whether in our LLM and SJD programs, our visiting scholars program or our JD program, we are fortunate to welcome scholars from around the world. Their presence here and among our alumni ranks adds a set of global perspectives that can only be achieved with this kind of diversity. And of course, the College of Law could not exist without the engine that drives everything that we do, my remarkable faculty colleagues. It's been a privilege to work alongside colleagues who are influential, cutting edge scholars, who are beloved and revered teachers, and media commentators and experts in their fields. Over the past seven years, we've worked hard to shine a bright light on the thought leadership of our faculty, encouraging, supporting, and promoting their research, publishing, blog posts, and media commentary. Since 2016, our faculty have written, co-written, or edited an impressive 52 books. I just want to shout out Professor Jan Fleckenstein, uh, our esteemed director of the Law Library, along with her dedicated team, who've played a crucial role in providing unwavering support to our faculty in these and numerous other endeavors. In terms of law review articles, which are the typical output of law faculty, several of uh, top 50 law journals have accepted or published some of the 210 articles written by our faculty over the last seven years. In fact, we've seen an almost fourfold increase in top 50 journal placements since 2016 compared to the five years before that. So sought after now is our legal expertise that thanks to the power of syndication, our faculty members appear in over 1,100 news outlets per year. 
They brought a measured and thoughtful perspective to sometimes noisy debates, and they've done their part to boost our academic reputation. Our faculty are also winning plaudits for their teaching. A few faculty members have been recognized for teaching excellence during my time as Dean, including Professor Sanjay Shablani and Lauren Golden, who were awarded Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith professorships for teaching excellence, which is one of the highest honors bestowed by the university. Professors Todd Berger, Lauren Golden, Shannon Gardner, and Ginny Breen have also received Meredith Teaching Recognition Awards, which recognize excellence in teaching among untenured faculty. Several faculty members have received tenure, including Professors Todd Berger, Lauren Golden, Andrew Kim, Cora True Frost, and Joseph Warburton. And finally, Professors David Dreesen and Professor Cora True Frost have both been selected as Fulbright Scholars. We've also added a number of new professors to our ranks since I arrived at the college. These include tenured lateral hires, Jamie Baker, Kristen Barnes, and Kat McFarland, Jenny Breen and Dan Traficanti in the tenure track, and Courtney Abbott Hill, Emily Brown, Kelly Curtis, Tony Ogidi, Jack Graves, Lori Hobart, Beth Kubala, Monica Luna, Jessica Murray, Kelly Perrin, and Mary Zito as teaching professors and Kristen Walker and Brian Gerling as professors of practice, and Maria Kadowska as a faculty fellow. Great teaching is the cornerstone of our law students' legal education experience. I've yet to meet an alumnus who doesn't have fond memories and who is grateful to one, two, or several faculty members who had a significant impact on their experience here. Perhaps connecting them with a career opportunity, helping them hone a particular skill, or just being a mentor. So let me say a heartfelt thank you to all my faculty colleagues for everything you do to educate and guide our students. When I arrived at the College of Law, we spent 2016, 2017 uh, that year reflecting on and identifying what it is that distinguishes us from the other 200 law schools in the country. We identified four areas of distinctive excellence. Our advocacy program, which trains students in trial and appellate practice, and the Disability Law and Policy Program, the Innovation Law Center, and the Institute for Security Policy and Law, each of which convenes diverse interdisciplinary perspectives in seeking solutions to the most complex problems in the world. Over the past seven years, we focused on building on those centers and institutes by deepening our domain expertise with new faculty or fellow hires, creating or expanding experiential opportunities in these areas, and developing new programming. The academic strategic plan that we've been working on and have just finalized over this last year reinforces this focus going forward. <clears throat> I'll say a bit about the growth, the growth of each of these areas uh, and share the story of four alumni whose career paths reflect their engagement with our areas of distinctive excellence. The College of Law has long been known for our outstanding advocacy program, founded by Travis H.D. Lewin and now led by Professor Todd Berger, who is himself an innovator. At the beginning of my tenure, you'll recall that I implemented, uh, implemented a comprehensive review of the advocacy program led by a blue ribbon panel of local trial lawyers and judges. And that resulted in a new curriculum focused on distinct areas of advocacy and the establishment of a revamped advocacy organization now known as the Travis H.D. Lewin Advocacy Honor Society. The Lewin Advocacy Honor Society has launched a number of new competitions. These include the Syracuse National Trial Competition, the Transatlantic Negotiation Competition, born in the heart of uh, the pandemic, the National Disability Law Appellate Competition, a Hall of Fame Sports and Entertainment Law Negotiation Competition, and finally, a first of its kind trial competition, the National Trial League. This features a season of short trial matches that are conducted virtually with winning teams advancing to playoffs, much like you see in a typical sports league. We re recently learned that UCLA's advocacy program has developed a course focused on the National Trial Competition and the league was, uh, or National Trial League, and the league was recognized last year by Bloomberg's Law School Innovation Program. Among the thousands of students who have benefited from the trial and advocacy program over the years is Davida Hawks. And I understand Davida's here. <laughs> <laughs> While she was a student here, Davida was an active member of AHS, where she competed on trial teams and won the 42nd 
annual Lionel O. Grossman trial competition as a 3L. Davida just celebrated her three-year anniversary as an assistant DA at the Westchester, Westchester County DA's office, which is the largest New York prosecutorial office outside of New York City. At the DA's office, Davida manages an extensive caseload and has tried numerous jury and non-jury trials to verdict, including the high-profile DWI prosecution of the New York Mets ex-general manager, Zach Scott. Serving her, serving her community is important to Davida. She's the lead prosecutor in a new Rochelle City Court initiative that links young uh, adults facing criminal charges to local organizations that offer training and access to employment services and community mentors. Davida is just one example of the extraordinary outcomes produced both by our trial and advocacy program and all of our faculty members who taught and guided Davida during her time here. The college's disability law expertise is reflected in the work of the Disability Law and Policy Program, as well as the Burton Blatt Institute. Now in its 18th year, the DLPP is the nation's most extensive program in the field. Under the leadership of Professor Arlene Cantor, we launched the first of its kind joint degree program in law and disability studies with the School of Education. That program has graduated 17 students in recent years and another 31 students have completed a curricular program certificate through the DLPP. As Professor Cantor retires next year after years of leadership, I look forward to seeing the great work that her successor, Kat McFarland, will do as she assumes the directorship of the DLPP. She's a leading expert on civil procedures, civil rights litigation, and disability law, and last year served as a special counsel for disability rights under the Office of Civil Rights for the U.S. Department of Education. Our expertise in disability law has produced extraordinary lawyers over the years, as Daniel Van Zandt's story illustrates. Daniel's a joint degree student who earned his JD alongside an MS from the School <laughs> of Education. For two years now, he served as a director of disability policy at the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. In this role, Daniel spearheads the disability work of the Harkin Institute, focusing on issues that advance the competitive, integrated employment of people with disabilities. From leading focus groups as part of a Medicaid waiver, waiver redesign project in Iowa, to consulting with corporations on disability inclusion around the country, Daniel's work is focused on enriching the lives of those with disabilities. He continues to be engaged with the place where he got his start in disability law and serves as co-chair of the DLPP alumni group. He's just one example of the extraordinary outcomes produced by our disability programs and all of our faculty members who taught and guided Daniel during his time here. Founded over 30 years ago by the late Professor Ted Hagelin and now led by Professor Brian Gerling, himself a College of Law alum and, who studied with Ted, the Innovation Law Center continues to educate law students on the technical, legal, and business aspects of bringing new technologies to market. The ILC has been New York State's only designated science and law technology center for over 20 years. It provides research, information, and advisory and support services to more than 30 universities and research centers in New York. Last spring, with the partnership of Syracuse University's Vice President for Research, Duncan Brown, the ILC finally realized my long-held goal of leading the SU Tech Transfer Office giving our students the opportunity to work on commercializing new technologies that are generated by our own university's researchers. In the last three years, the ILC has grown exponentially, more than doubling its student enrollment and employing about a dozen student researchers. Bloomberg Law recognized the center in its innovation experience category in 2022. We've also partnered with the Whitman School of Management to offer a new certificate of advanced study in technology, law, and entrepreneurship that will better equip students to pursue careers at the intersection of law, business, and technology. Under the supervision of faculty, ILC Research Associates, our students have assisted over 500 clients over the years, including corporations, startup tech companies, entrepreneurs, and inventors. As one of these research associates, Cecily Capo drew on her scientific background and a BS in environmental science from SUNY ESF, to help ILC clients. Handling about a dozen ILC clients as a 3L, Cecily lent her expertise to all sorts of projects from, 
non-surgical um, solution for sleep apnea to an eco-friendly water filtration system. Cicely is also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Science and Technology at the law school. And after graduation this spring, she took her valuable skills and now applies them to her daily work as a first-year associate in Bond Shank and King's intellectual property practice group. Cicely is just one example of the extraordinary outcomes produced by the ILC and all of our faculty members who taught and guided her during her time here. Finally, the Institute for Security and Policy Law is a collaboration between the College of Law and the Maxwell School. It aims to educate and inspire the next generation of national security practitioners and thought leaders. Founded as the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism in 2003, INSCIT, as you may recall, we renamed the center in 2019 to reflect its global mission and an emphasis on emerging security challenges like AI, quantum com computing, gene editing, and climate change, as well as security threats from Russia and China. Now, ISPL counts over 800 alumni in positions across a broad array of government and military intelligence and security organizations, second only in this regard to Georgetown Law Center. ISPL is unique in having a judge, Jamie Baker, as a director, and a vice admiral, Bob Barrett, as deputy director. In response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Professor Baker founded the Ring Around Russia Partnership for Law and Policy, a network of scholars, universities, and civil society organizations in the frontline states committed to advancing a law-based vision of national security to address Russian aggression and disinformation and to provide for European, NATO, and US security. In the past year, ISPL has hosted two symposia on Ukraine and participated in two others. The ISPL Law Review Symposium last year was the first symposium on the Ukraine invasion hosted by a U.S. law school. As a former Finnish intelligence professional, professional as Finnish professional from Finland, <laughs> and, and EU diplomat, uh, Lada Lampella was attracted to the LLM program at the College of Law because of the opportunity it offered for her to study the interfaces between U.S. constitutional law, international law, and national security. She took a leap of faith and decided to leave her over 20 year career in positions at the nexus of international and security policy law in the EU to start anew in the US. Upon coming to Syracuse, she quickly found her academic home at ISPL. Under the mentorship of, of Professor Baker, Lada made key contributions to the Institute's pioneering work on strengthening the rule of law and national security in Ukraine and other frontline states. She also worked pro bono as a lead author at the Global Accountability Network, a worldwide NGO, which was established by our retired colleague, Professor David Crane. Post-graduation, Lada serves as a law clerk at the Vermont Judiciary. She's just one example of the extraordinary outcomes produced by ISPL and all of our faculty members who taught and guided Lada during her time here. As I come to the end of my remarks, and there is an end, let me, be brief, let me briefly address the college's fiscal situation. Some of you in this room will remember that the College of Law ran budget deficits of several million dollars per year going back to the Great Recession, resulting in a cumulative deficit of nearly $18 million when I became dean in 2016. Thanks to the support of Chancellor Sivaru, that deficit was erased. And since then, we've moved on to surplus through revenue from our JD Interactive and expanded LLM programs, strategic cost cutting, and a robust fundraising campaign. As this slide reflects, I'm pleased to say that the fiscal state of the college is sound and that we project it to be so for the next several years. As to that fundraising, we are so grateful for the monetary support of our alumni and friends, which has been instrumental to creating a stable fiscal position for the school. I'm pleased to say that in fiscal year 2023, under the leadership of former Assistant Dean for Advancement, Sophie Dejeuner, we raised over $5.2 million from nearly 1,500 donors. In each of the last two years, in fact, we have set both annual fund and new business records for the College of Law. Strong financial giving results from having engaged alumni who continue to give back to our college, not just financially, but also through mentoring students, lecturing and teaching courses, judging competitions, serving on our advisory boards and committees and participating in other programming. 
So important is engagement that one of the three goals of SU's current campus-wide fundraising campaign, Forever Orange, is to increase the engagement of our alumni and SU Central Advancement tracks this measure closely. It shouldn't surprise you to learn that among all 12 Syracuse University schools and colleges, the College of Law has the highest rate of alumni engagement by a significant margin. We also have the highest alumni giving participation each year and the highest alumni participation in this Forever Orange campaign. Some of you will have perhaps already seen in the announcement of my upcoming departure, the most exciting news that I can share with you today. As of three weeks ago, the College of Law has met and exceeded our goals for the Forever Orange campaign. We did so more than a year ahead of schedule. Under former Assistant Dean Dejeuner's tireless leadership over the course of the campaign, we have successfully raised more than $38 million and secured 5,000 donors. We've also actively engaged more than 30% of our alumni, which far exceeds our goal of 20%. So please, let's pause for a moment so you can give yourselves a well-deserved round of applause for the role that each of you played in helping to achieve this tremendous success. Your gifts ensure that we continue the trajectory that we began together seven years ago, that we attract the best and brightest and offer them appropriate financial aid to help make their career dreams a reality, that we support a faculty that, need, that meets the needs of students and advances the research and programs that are our hallmark, and that we have financial stability and flexibility now and into the future. Thank you for all you do for the college, and please continue to invest in our mission in the years to come. In closing, I want to reiterate the deep sense of pride that I feel in our accomplishments. From the launch of groundbreaking programs and the growth of our differentiating centers and institutes, to increasing the diversity and credentials of our students, and finally meeting our fundraising goal a year early, serving as the dean of this amazing institution has been the great highlight and honor of my 20-year academic career. Thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for our students and our school. I'm deeply thankful for the opportunity to have served as Dean alongside an exceptional community of alumni, faculty, staff, and students. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the day and on into this evening in our, our fabulous awards ceremony, which you won't want to miss. So thank you for being here this morning.